Chapter twenty three of the Hoosier Schoolmaster by Edward Eggleston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. Chapter twenty three. A charitable institution. When Ralph got back to Miss Nancy Sawyer's, Shocky was sitting up in bed talking to Miss Nancy and Miss Samantha. His cheeks were a little flushed with fever and the excitement of telling his story. Theirs were wet with tears. Ralph whispered Miss Nancy as she drew him into the kitchen. I want you to get a buggy or a sleigh and go right over to the poorhouse and fetch that boy's mother over here. It'll do me more good than any sermon I ever heard to see that boy in his mother's arms tomorrow. We can keep the old lady over Sunday. Ralph was delighted, so delighted that he came near kissing good Miss Nancy Sawyer, whose plain face was glorified by her generosity. But he did not go to the poorhouse immediately. He waited until he saw Bill Jones, the superintendent of the poorhouse, and Pete Jones, the county commissioner, who was still somewhat shuck up, ride up to the courthouse. Then he drove out of the village, and presently hitched his horse to the poorhouse fence, and took a survey of the outside. Forty hogs, nearly ready for slaughter, wallowed in a pen in front of the forlorn and dilapidated house. For though the commissioners allowed a claim for repairs at every meeting, the repairs were never made, and it would not do to scrutinize Mr. Jones's bills too closely, unless you gave up all hope of renomination to office. One curious effect of political aspirations in Hoopole County was to shut the eyes that they could not see, to close the ears that they could not hear, and to destroy the sense of smell. But Ralph, not being a politician, smelled the hog-pen without and the stench within, and saw everywhere the transparent fraud, and heard the echo of Jones's cruelty. A weak-eyed girl admitted him, and as he did not wish to make his business known at once, he affected a sort of idle interest in the place, and asked to be allowed to look around. The weak-eyed girl watched him. He found that all the women with children, twenty persons in all, were obliged to sleep in one room, which, owing to the hill-slope, was partly underground, and which had but half a window for light, and no ventilation, except the chance draught from the door. Jones had declared that the woman with children must stay there. He weren't going to have brats a-runnin' over the whole house. Here were vicious women and good women, with their children, crowded like chickens in a coop for market. And there were, as usual in such places, helpless, idiotic women with illegitimate children. Of course this room was a scene of perpetual quarreling and occasional fighting. In the quarters devoted to the insane, people slightly demented and raving maniacs were in the same rooms, while there were also those utter wrecks which sat in heaps on the floor, mumbling and muttering unintelligible words, the whole current of their thoughts hopelessly muddled, turning around upon itself in eddies never ending. "'That air woman,' said the weak-eyed girl, "'used to holler a heap when she was brought in here. "'But Pap knows how to subdue em. "'He slapped her in the mouth every time she hollered. "'She don't make no first now, "'but just sets down that way all day, "'and keeps a whisperin'. "'Ralph understood it. "'When she came in she was the victim of mania, "'but she had been beaten into hopeless idiocy. "'Indeed, this state of incurable imbecility "'seemed the end toward which all travelled. Shut in these bare rooms, with no treatment, no exercise, no variety, and meagre food, cases of slight derangement soon grew into chronic lunacy. One young woman called Phil, a sweet-faced person, apparently a farmer's wife, came up to Ralph and looked at him kindly, playing with the buttons on his coat in a childlike simplicity. Her blue drilling dress was sewed all over with patches of white, representing ornamental buttons. The womanly instinct toward adornment had in her taken this childish turn. "'Don't you think they ought to let me go home?' she said, with a sweetness and a wistful, longing, homesick look, that touched Rolf to the heart. He looked at her, and then at the muttering crones, and he could see no hope of any better fate for her. She followed him round the barn-like rooms, returning every now and then to her question, "'Don't you think I might go home now?' The weak-eyed girl had been called away for a moment, 
and Ralph stood looking into a cell, where there was a man with a gay red plume in his hat and a strip of red flannel about his waist. He strutted up and down like a drill sergeant. "'I am General Andrew Jackson,' he began. "'People don't believe it, but I am. I had my head shot off at Buene Visti, and the new one that growed on isn't nigh so good as the old one. It's tater on one side. That's why they take advantage of me to shut me up. But I know some things. My head is tater on one side, but it's all right on t'other. And when I know a thing in the left side of my head, I know it. Lean down here. Let me tell you something out of the left side. Not out of the tater side, mind ye. I wouldn't a told you if he hadn't locked me up for nothing. Bill Jones is a thief. He sells the bodies of the dead paupers, and then sells the empty coffins back to the county again. But that ain't all. Just then the weak-eyed girl came back, and as Ralph moved away, General Jackson called out, "'That ain't all. I'll tell the rest another time. And that ain't out of the tater side. You can depend on that. That's out of the left side. Sound as a nut on that side.' But Ralph began to wonder where he should find Hannah's mother. "'Don't go in there,' cried the weak-eyed girl, as Ralph was opening a door. "'Old Mowley's in there, and she'll cuss you.' "'Oh, well, if that's all, her curses won't hurt,' said Hartsook, pushing open the door. But the volley of blasphemy and vile language that he received made him stagger. The old hag paced the floor, abusing everybody that came in her way. And by the window, in the same room, feeling the light that struggled through the dusty glass upon her face— sat a sorrowful, intelligent Englishwoman. Ralph noticed at once that she was English, and in a few moments he discovered that her sight was defective. Could it be that Hannah's mother was the roommate of this loathsome creature, whose profanity and obscenity did not intermit for a moment? Happily the weak-eyed girl had not dared to brave the curses of Mowley. Ralph stepped forward to the woman by the window and greeted her. "'Is this Mrs. Thompson?' "'That is my name, sir,' she said, turning her face toward Ralph, who could not but remark the contrast between the thorough refinement of her manner and her coarse, scant, unshaped pauper frock of blue drilling. "'I saw your daughter yesterday.' "'Did you see my boy?' There was a tremulousness in her voice, and an agitation in her manner which disclosed the emotion she strove in vain to conceal." for only the day before Bill Jones had informed her that Shocky would be bound out on Saturday, and that she would find that going again him weren't a pay in business, so much as some others he might mention. Ralph told her about Shocky's safety. I shall not write down the conversation here. Critics would say that it was an overwrought scene. As if all the world were as cold as they, all I can tell is that this refined woman had all she could do to control herself in her eagerness to get out of her prison-house, away from the blasphemies of Mowley, away from the insults of Jones, away from the sights and sounds and smells of the place, and above all, her eagerness to fly to the little shocky head from whom she had been banished for two years. It seemed to her that she could gladly die now, if she could die with that flaxen head upon her bosom. And so, in spite of the opposition of Bill Jones's son, who threatened her with every sort of evil if she left, Ralph wrapped Mrs. Thompson's blue drilling in Nancy Sawyer's shawl, and bore the feeble woman off to Lewisburg. And as they drove away, a sad, childlike voice cried from the gratings of the upper window, "'Good-bye, good-bye!' Ralph turned and saw that it was Phil, poor Phil, for whom there was no deliverance and all the way back Ralph pronounced mental maledictions on the Dorca Society, not for sending garments to the Five Points or the South Sea Islands, whichever it was, but for being so blind to the sorrow and poverty within its reach. He did not know, for he had not read the reports of the Boards of State Charities, that nearly all almshouses are very much like this, and that the State of New York is not better in this regard than Indiana. And he did not know that it is true in almost all other counties, as it was in his own, that Christian people do not think enough of Christ to look for him in these lazar houses. And while Ralph denounced the Dorcas Society, the eager, hungry heart of the mother ran, flew toward the little white-headed boy. No, I cannot do it. I cannot tell you about that meeting. I am sure that Miss Nancy Sawyer's tea tasted exceedingly good to the pauper, who had known nothing but cold water for years, 
and that the bread and butter were delicious to a palate that had eaten poorhouse soup for dinner, and coarse poorhouse bread and vile molasses for supper, and that without change for three years. But I cannot tell you how it seemed that evening to Miss Nancy Sawyer, as the poor English lady sat in speechless ecstasy, rocking in the old splint-bottom rocking-chair in the firelight, while she pressed to her bosom with all the might of her enfeebled arms, the form of the little shocky, who half sobbed, and half sang, over and over again, God ha'n't forgot us, mother, God ha'n't forgot us. End of chapter 23